Welcome to Rahel Baptist Church for Wednesday evening, March the 8th, 2023. This evening's message is brought to us by Brother Steve Stewart and is titled, What's Holding You Back from True Worship? And is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Enjoy. All right, everybody. Let's uh, find our seats and let's find your Bible. And we're going to turn to the book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter tonight. We're going to talk about worship and the importance of worship uh, in your life. I'm glad you're here tonight. Um, Pastor Mike is uh, uh, still proceeding and still progressing. And uh, I was a little more tired today, but uh, uh, he is uh, home resting. And and just continue to pray uh, for him if you would. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful to be in your house tonight, Lord, and I like what David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Lord, it's a great place to be on any occasion, but to corporately come together to worship is so important and so vital. So I pray, Lord, you'll be with our scripture text tonight, and uh, Lord, we will glean from your word uh, everything you want us to learn tonight. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Well, that's a, that's, that's a pretty good amen. And everybody said, amen. all right, you are alive and well. I'm glad to, glad to see that. Well, there's a little boy. He jumped up on a pew one Sunday, and um, he began to look around, and he was just filled with excitement. And this little boy was just three years old, and he was in church for the very first time in his life. Now, I can relate to this. I have a three-year-old son, a grandson named Brooks, and he would probably jump up on the chair or on the pew, if you will. And uh, it just seemed like this little three-year-old couldn't contain himself at all. So while he was enjoying his vantage point, his mama was not so pleased with him. And um, this mom whispered to him, sit down, sit down. We don't do this in church. And if you know three-year-olds like I do, their attention span or sit-down span is about 30 seconds. So guess what? He was back up, standing up on the pew once again. And there he began to discover all kinds of new and interesting things. He would look and he would see the stained glass windows. He would see the choir in their robes. And he would look and he would see hymn books. And uh, he was just amazed at everything uh, that he was seeing. But his mom was not too amazed with him. And so she abruptly pulled him down by his belt and set him back down. Well, again, 30 seconds later, the little three-year-old was right back up on the pew. Singing was going on now, and this really interested him. And, and uh, he was engaged in looking around and, and watching everybody. But the mom began to act very decisively this time. And in a, in a hiss, she said, sit down. Well, it was so loud, people three rows behind her heard it. But she sat him down, took him by the belt, and once again sat down. And that little boy sat there for just a few minutes. <laughs> and he looked up at his mother and had a little tear in his eye. And he said this, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. But I got to thinking about that, and I've shared that little illustration before, but I got to thinking about that when it comes to worship. This little fellow was very eager, very interested in seeing what was going on when he came into the sanctuary, when he came into the house of God. And so that's what I want to talk about a little bit tonight is what's keeping us or what's holding us back from worship. And, um, you know, I know tonight I'm preaching to the Wednesday night crowd and you're here every single service and that's awesome. But you may come to a service at some point in your life, or maybe you have in the past, and you were there, you just showed up, you really didn't worship. And so tonight we're going to look at the prophet Isaiah, and we're going to look in Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to glean from this uh, three different things, and I'll give that to you as we go along here tonight concerning worship. Let me give you these quotes, and uh, I found these quotes, but I cannot, I could not find, most. two of them were anonymous, and I couldn't find the uh, the author of the other, but I want to share them with you anyway. The first one is this, lots of people find themselves in places of worship, but it's quite possible that few will really worship in the place they are. Now think about that. 
The second one was this. In the end, worship can never be a performance, something you're pretending or putting on. It has to be an overflow of your heart. Worship is about getting personal with God and drawing close to God. Would you agree with that? It's getting personal with God and growing close to God. And then the third one is this. God is not moved or impressed with our worship until our hearts are moved and impressed by Him. Now, God desires true worship. I know in John chapter 4, when Jesus was talking with the woman at the well, He said we must worship in spirit and in truth. We understand that. So God is after true worship. And by the way, God is worthy of true worship. Amen? And so we're going to look at uh, this uh, particular passage, and the outline is on the board there if you want to, and we do have sheets there if you'd like to keep one. But uh, the three different points are in worship there's revelation, seeing God as He is. In worship there's realization. Now this is the tough part, seeing ourselves as we are. And then worship is a response, seeing change. And we'll deal with that and we'll look at that as we go through uh, here. But look at Isaiah chapter 6 and beginning in verse 1, we'll go through verse 4 as we read uh, this particular part. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Now, when you think about King Uzziah, I'm not sure if Isaiah ever laid eyes on him. I have an idea that he probably did. And so he, had, he knew who King Uzziah was, uh, the leader uh, of that day. But I'm not, I'm not uh, totally sure he saw him. But I know for a fact he had never seen God. But God had a vision to take place here. And he said, I saw the Lord, and where was the Lord? Sitting on the throne. He was high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two covered, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, a couple of things that I see within this first part here in Isaiah chapter 6. First of all, he saw the Lord. He saw the Lord. In a vision, he sees God enthroned in, his, in the midst of the glories of heaven. That's where his throne is. And King Uzziah had died, but the true king of kings was reigning supreme. And that true king of kings was the Lord himself. So he literally saw God, the one who is in charge of it all. And we have to understand that when we come into, uh, well, even when we wake up each and every day, we need to understand who's in charge. If you're a child of God, you're not in charge. Are you hearing me? When we give our heart and our life to the Lord, he is in charge. And uh, that's the way it has to be. So, I'm going to ask you this, when you come into the house of God, do you see God? Do you know Him? He is high and He is exalted. And that should be the way it is with your spiritual eye. You should see Him highly, high and exalted. That means He's above all. That means He's elevated. That means, as the Bible puts it, He is preeminent. The Bible also says He is the most powerful. He is almighty God. And he is foremost. He is to be first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So we see that all of those things are about God. So if you don't see God in that way, maybe you need to stand up in your chair tonight and get a little bit better view of who God is. Just like that little boy did. So he saw the Lord and that he was high and lifted up. But he also, not only did he see the Lord, but he heard the praise. Don't you just love praise? Now, you know, we get up here on Sunday morning and we begin uh, uh, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs, and that's what the book of Ephesians tells us to do, right? So we ought to be praising, and I hope you are praising God 
uh, each time you come into, into his sanctuary. But praising God is not just a Sunday thing. Praising God is an everyday thing. And not only is praising, and we need to hear the praises of God even in our own heart each day, but we need to see the Lord each day in our life, right? And so here, uh, Isaiah is speaking of seraphs or angelic beings. Now, this is interesting. In the Hebrew, that word means to burn. And I really believe what it is, it's a graphic way of expressing the zeal of their worship, this angelic worship. And they were expressing it. And how did they do that? Well, I'm going to show you uh, that they, uh, uh, they used their six wings. Now, you and I don't have six wings, okay? There's not going to be any of us start flying around in here tonight with, with, with two wings. But what they did, we can certainly do, okay? Because here's what happened. In humility, they're unable to look upon him. And so they covered up with two wings, okay? In reverence, they hid their feet. So when you come into the sanctuary, you are to come in here with humility and with reverence. That doesn't mean you have to just sit there and, and not move or not say a word. By the way, there was something exciting happened oh, three or four weeks ago right here in this sanctuary. We were singing a song, and actually there was a Baptist that shouted. I don't remember, I don't know which uh, section it was in, but man, I thought about just singing that song all over again, see if we get more shouting. But, but I think we need to have a little bit more of that. It doesn't mean that we're, we're just to pipe down and, and, and not express. Because these angels, these seraphs around the throne of God, they were, they were expressing their worship. And the third uh, set of wings was in readiness, they were in readiness to serve him. And so they would fly around the throne, willing and ready to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. So Isaiah saw the Lord, and he heard the praise of these angels. And they were completely, these angels, listen, were completely attentive our attention span is not real long, is it? Somebody said, I heard say one time that uh, an adult attention span is about 18 minutes. Now, I didn't, never did see what a kid is, so a 30, for a three-year-old, it's like 30 seconds, but you get the, you get the idea. So attentiveness needs to be worked on, and, and I think part of attentive, being attentive is being focused on what we're here to do, and that is to worship. But they were energized. You know, we have, <laughs> or sometimes you, you see people come into church and they just don't have a whole lot of energy. Some of them even look like they've been vaccinated in pickle juice or something. I mean, it's just sour. Well, we need to have some energy, right? We're in the house of God. We're here to praise. We're here to hear, we are here to hear the Word of God spoken to us. And that ought to energize us. And again, humility and reverence should be a part of of our praise. Now, did you notice there in verse 3 that there was a never-ending cry? A never-ending cry. What were, they, what were they saying? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You wonder where we get our hymn, holy, holy, holy from? From scripture like that? Now, we get to sing it. They were crying it out. They were saying it, and they were speaking it, and it was never ending. Turn to Revelation 4.8. I'm sure Brother Mike will be covering this in about six months. Hey, there's, there's, a, there's a ton of stuff in the book of Revelation, so if it takes six months, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Verse 8, verse eight of chapter 4 says, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So folks, for worship to be what God intends for it to be, worship must change the heart of the worshiper. The focus must be on God. So I ask you tonight, is there anything holding you back from worship? 
there's a revelation. You've got to see God. You've got to hear the praise. But there's a second thing, and that, that is something that's going to kind of hit more home to us, and we're going to relate to this. In worship, there's realization, seeing ourselves as God sees us. Now, again, in, in the book of Isaiah, we're going to look at verses 5 through 7. And Isaiah said this, So I said, Woe is me. I think he probably, probably thought about it and said, Whoa! <laughs> I didn't really want to see that. But I want to tell you this, when you get in the presence of God, you're going to see yourself for who you really are. You ever, any of y'all ever look in a mirror? Come on now, y'all can at least shake your head. You ever see any flaws? You ever see any wrinkles? Well, there's a lot of products out there to get the wrinkles out, isn't there? We must see ourselves as God sees us. It goes on to say, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. In other words, God revealed to him what was actually wrong in his life, and that was he was saying some things he shouldn't have been saying. Unclean lips, and he was influenced, apparently, by those who were around him. Because it says here, I dwell in the midst of these people that have unclean lips. Now, I don't know exactly what that was. It's not indicated here, but it had to be something that was sinful because God revealed it to him that this was wrong. And so he said, Woe is me, because I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king. <laughs> there we go. It's telling us that because I've seen who God is, it's made me see myself for who I am. Now, have you ever found yourself not liking what you see on the inside sometimes? I know I do. I, there, there's times in my life that I find as the Spirit of God convicts me and brings it up to my mind that I just don't look too good. And then he begins to deal with me on the areas of life that need to be cleaned up. So Isaiah knew about the sin in his life and it was never clear as when he was in the presence of the Lord. But sometimes I see what I see today among Christian people is not much difference between the lifestyle of the people of God and the lifestyle of the world. That's sad, but that is how it is. And maybe it's because they're not close to God and they're not seeing God for who He is so they can see themselves for who they are. I remember as a kid growing up, even through my teenage years, there was never a service Sunday morning or Sunday night that the altars weren't filled with people getting right with God. Man, I long to see those days again, Brother Phil. I do. You probably saw that back in the past, and maybe you have as well. People understanding as they hear the Word of God and they hear the praises of God and they realize that they're, they're just unclean. And so the altars are filled with people getting right with God. You talk about a revival, if people would do that. Just let go of their inhibitions and just... Let go and let God and just come down and repent and make it right. That's what Isaiah did. And it wasn't something he waited to do a year later. It was something he did immediately. Woe is me! It says later on in this, it says that the seraph in verse 6 flew to me having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. I want to tell you, there's nothing better than the cleansing, forgiving touch of God. You know what I mean. You've been there, right? Oh, we, we got all perfect people in here tonight. No, we've all been there, okay? We've all been in, in, a, in a situation where we have been away from God and the Holy Spirit convicts us and we come back to God and He cleanses us. David said it like this, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Renew a right spirit within me. Folks, I think that's something we need to be checking on each day of our life. And then I want you to turn to Psalm 32. This is 
a passage that I've looked at many, many times and have preached on many times, but I want to just share a few thoughts on this is when David really came to himself. This is when the Spirit of God, after a year, and the Spirit of God had gotten all over him, and God used the prophet Nathan to say, hey, you're the man. You're the one that's at fault. You're the one that has sinned. And so David, as, he, as we'll see here in Psalm 32, he expresses himself. And it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed or happy is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now that's where we need to be in our life. We need to, we need to uh, understand and we need to be happy because our sins are forgiven. We need to be happy because uh, there's no iniquity in our life. We need to be there. We need to strive for that. I know we'll never be perfect, but we need to strive for that. And so in verse 3, David begins to explain to us how he is under conviction. And he says this, When I kept silent, my bones grew old. <laughs> For day, or excuse me, through my groaning all the day long. You ever been so convicted that, that uh, all you do is find yourself groaning in your spirit? Now folks, that's a bad place to be, but it's a good place to be too. Because the Spirit of God is dealing with you. Okay? And so, he says, for day and night, your hand, God, was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Man, I've experienced that. I have experienced the hand of God uh, pressing down on my heart and on my life. And then you'll see the word selah. Do you see that? Now, not, men not a lot's mentioned about that, but I remember David Jeremiah using uh, this text one time and and he shared this word selah uh, in reference to the conviction that David was under. And he used this analogy, it's as if you were doing like this. <sighs> and when you're under conviction, that's exactly how you feel. <sighs> but then, David confesses. He said, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And get this, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And you see the word selah. And by the way, that word simply means stop and think about it, okay? But it can also, it's kind of like a, a musical term. It's, it's changing gears. It's changing keys. There's a modulation happening. There's something, something different going to take place or has take, taken place. And so with conviction, he felt like this. Oh. But with confession, he felt like this. Whew. You ever felt that way? Because when you confess your sin to God, he's faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And all of a sudden, you just feel, Whew. <laughs> there's been a burden lifted. There's been something that's been taken off your back. And folks, it's something only God can do. But then it goes on, verse 6. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may, may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. Then it says, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. So we see in the first part he was convicted. We see that he confessed. Whew. And now we see celebration. Hey, he's back with God. He's back where he needs to be. So folks, that's what it means when we stand in the presence in the throne room of God. We see God who, for who he is, but we also see ourselves for who we are. And folks, we're sinners. Amen? Imperfect. But... God wants us to strive to be like his son Jesus. And I hope that that's what you're doing. So, in worship there's revelation. In worship there's realization. But lastly, in worship there's a response. 
I hope every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, I hope you go out of this building, out of this sanctuary, a changed person. Because that's what we do when we come together corporately. We come together to, from this stage to present Jesus Christ. It's not Brother Mike or Brother Steve or Brother Cody or anybody else. It's not the praise team, the, pen, the instrumentalists, the singers, the choir. We're all leaders in worship. And we must, we must, we must convey Jesus Christ. And if we convey Jesus Christ for who he is, guess what? Everybody's going to leave here changed. Because something's going to happen in their heart. Something's going to happen in their life. Let me tell you this. If worship does not change us, it hadn't been worship. To stand before the Holy One of eternity is to change. Worship begins in holy expectancy. It ends in holy obedience. So we must expect God to do something, but we must be obedient as His children. Now, that pits us back to verse 8. Isaiah 6, verse 8. Because we're going to see obedience in action here. I will... In Excuse me, let me get back to Isaiah. I'm still in, in the book of Psalms. Verse 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord say. So he heard the angels praising, but now he is in tune with God. And when you're in tune with God, you're going to hear his voice. Okay? I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. There had been a change in his life. I have an idea that the Lord was going to send him back to those people with unclean lips. <laughs> you know, those people need you. Those people have a problem. You got caught up in it now. Go show them who you are now. Go show the real you and who you really are. And so I want to end, and I've got just enough time. I want you to turn to um, the book of Matthew in the 17th chapter. And I want you to see something I, I think just, it just blew me away. And this, this passage has always been a wonderful passage to me. And I enjoy uh, studying it. And I enjoy reading it. In verse 17, verse 1, or chapter 17, verse 1, says, Now after six days, G Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he, tra he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. So here we find that Jesus has taken some companions to share in a wonderful worship experience. I'm going to tell you, they, did not, they had not ever had an experience like they were going to experience that day on the Mount of Transfiguration. And there's one thing that I notice in here is that Jesus was prepared to worship. Listen to me, folks. I hope you don't wait till five minutes before you come in this sanctuary to prepare to worship. I hope there's more focus on Jesus than that. Right? I hope it's an everyday process that you are focused upon Jesus. Okay? It was, this was not a spur-of-the-moment thing. Jesus uh, gathered them up and he said, we're going to go and we're going to have a worship experience. Well, let's go on and read the rest. Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. That's awesome. And these disciples thought it was awesome that Elijah and, and, and Moses was there. And the one that always opened his mouth, Peter, answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And it is. It's good to be in a worship experience with Jesus. But he goes on to say, if you wish, let us make here three tabernacles for you, or one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. <laughs> Folks, don't ever add anything to, to Jesus. He's all we need for worship. Okay? And so, so Peter did all that, and while he was still speaking, while Peter was still uttering these words, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out and said, and said, of the cloud and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, hear him. I think God was saying, worship him. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. 
But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So folks, when you come into this sanctuary, as we corporately do on Sundays and Wednesdays, I hope Jesus is all that you see. Because he's the one that will change your life. I can't do it. Mike can't do it. Cody can't do it. But Jesus can change your life. And I hope after tonight, I hope tonight through this, he's changed your heart already. And uh, you've learned some things about worship. So what's keeping you from true worship? Maybe it's a hidden sin in your life. Maybe it's just something that's been weighing you down for a long time. I just want to tell you, give it to Jesus and let him change you. All right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, thank you for books like Isaiah and books like Matthew, Lord, that teach us things, Lord, that uh, we just really need. So, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we will really take seriously the, the act of worship. Lord, you said that uh, we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices holy and acceptable unto you, which is our spiritual act of worship. So God, I pray, Lord, that we will do that very thing. So Lord, as we go into our prayer time, Lord, I pray as we lift up these names, uh, Lord, that you will just uh, grant us your grace and your mercy. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rahel Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.